Good afternoon. How are you doing today? I uh, hope you're keeping busy. All right. So I'm going to read one of our leveled readers today, and this is about Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, many of you, you know, we have our city parks like Deming and Collet. Um, there are state parks, you know, like Turkey Run, McCormick's Creek. Some of you may have been to those. Then we have national parks, and these are huge in comparison. So let's start reading chapter one, the park. Have you ever seen the Rockies? That's what most people call the Rocky Mountains. The Rockies are part of a huge mountain range. They stretch from Alaska all the way down to New Mexico. That's a really long way. The Rockies are 300 miles wide in some places. They are more than 3,000 miles long. Only the Andes Mountains in South America are longer. In the United States, the Rockies extend through several states in the western region. Part of the Rocky Mountains runs through Colorado. At Rocky Mountain National Park, you can get a close-up view of the mountains. You can learn what makes the mountains and the park so special. And so since I've done a couple of lessons on text features here, I really wanted to point those out. So here we have a picture. Um, and the caption tells us the Rockies march up North America. And along with that, we have a map that shows where the Rockies run. Okay. And it tells you that there are several national parks in the Rockies. Okay. So, and again, we have our key that explains what's happening in the map. The park is a good place to study three mountain ecosystems or life zones. Each zone covers a different elevation or height on the mountains. The zones also have different plants, animals, and climates. So we have a chart here, okay, and it's showing us where those three different um, ecosystems are, okay. This shows the elevation range of each mountain life zone. So here we have the montane. And here we have the subalpine, and here we have the alpine tundra. It gives us also um, the elevation or the height, the above sea level, um, that each of these, where they occur. Okay, we also have a sidebar down here. Fact, Rocky Mountain National Park was founded in 1915. It covers 415 square miles. It is a biosphere reserve, which means... All the animals and plants in the park are protected. So we also saw here that we have bold words, and then they explain those. So ecosystems was bold, and then it tells us or life zones. So that tells us what ecosystems are. Elevation or height. All right. So chapter two. Let's take a closer look at the three life zones of Rocky Mountain National Park. We'll begin our study down low at the bottom of the mountains. This location is the montane life zone. The montane starts at about 6,000 feet above sea level. It continues up to about 9,000 feet. And these ponderosa pines thrive in the montane climate. So again, pictures with captions. The montane is the most temperate of the life zones. Life is plentiful here. Tall ponderosa pines and Douglas fir trees grow here. They grow in groups called stands. Aspen and willow trees grow next to fast flowing streams. The leaves on the trees whisper and rustle in the breeze. Flowers and berries grow in, a wide, in wide meadows and on grassy hillsides. So here again we have a picture with a caption. Um, when air gets colder in the fall, aspen leaves turn gold, and it's they're really beautiful. Um, and they really do, they, they whisper and kind of, you know, they it, it's almost like, you, like someone is whispering around you. Um, we also had words that are in italics here, stands. Okay, so they, they wanted you to note that, and of course it means growing in groups, and that's what they're called. Many kinds of wildlife live in the montane ecosystem. Lively squirrels 
leap from tree to tree. They gather pine tree pine seeds to eat. Elk, moose, and mule deer graze in the meadows. Predators like coyotes and bobcats hunt mice and chipmunks. Eagles search for prey from the skies. They look for food to feed their young. Bluebirds and jays make nests too. You can hear the birds calling. And then this picture has the caption, this Abbott's squirrel lives in the montane. Okay, and so you can see him getting the pine nuts out of the pine cone. Um, the author used a lot of description here, okay, and, and it helps you to almost picture what it would be like to be standing there. Chapter 3, the subalpine zone. Let's continue our journey. We'll move up higher into the mountains. The next life zone is the subalpine. Sub means below. Alpine means very high. This is the middle zone. It is below the alpine zone. The subalpine zone goes up to about 11,000 feet above sea level. The subalpine zone is darker and wetter than the montane. Thick forests of subalpine fir trees and Engelmann spruce trees curve up the mountain. So we have another picture here. Almost looks like snowfall maybe in the background there. Subalpine forests are filled with Engelmann spruce trees. So showing you what those Engelmann spruce trees look like. At the highest edges of the subalpine, we come across eerie twisted shapes. Believe it or not, these gnarled figures are trees. They are called Krumholtz trees. Why do these trees look so strange? The winters are long and hard at this elevation. Strong, cold wind blows. The wind bends spruce and fir trees. It changes their growth. The trees grow low and bent over. They are not straight and tall like trees lower down. And our caption says, Krumholt trees can be centuries old. So even though they're in that very harsh environment, they can live a very long life. The subalpine is home to a mixture of animals as well. Mule deer eat woody plants and leafy herbs. In the summer season, the deer find plenty to eat in the subalpine zone. Pine martens and bobcats also like this zone, and birds have plenty of nesting space on the forest. Juncos and chickadees are common, and both of those are birds. The picture, the caption with the picture says pine martens, such as this one, live in the subalpine zone. And when I was um, in the Rockies, we were lucky enough to see a couple of martens, which is kind of kind of rare. Chapter four: The Alpine Tundra. Let's keep climbing. We leave the forest and finally arrive at the third life zone. Now we are in the highest part of the park. This is the alpine tundra zone, which is above 11,000 feet. The highest peaks in the park are in this zone. Dozens of these peaks are more than 12,000 feet high. To understand how high that is, think about airplanes. Airplanes fly at about 30,000 feet. These peaks are almost half as far up, so you know that these are very tall mountains. And so again, here we had a bold word, okay? And you know, it was Alpine Tundra Zone and it tells you that that's the area that's above 11,000 feet at the top of the mountain. Our caption says, Long's Peak rises to 14,255 feet and is the highest point in the park. Not in all of the Rockies, but in the park. At first, the rocky slopes of the alpine zone look empty. We are above the tree line here, so no trees grow. Winds howl and snow falls most of the year in this harsh climate. But if you look closely, you'll see that this zone is not lifeless. Tucked in close to the ground, some hardy plants and flowers grow and bloom. Many of the plants escape the fierce winds by growing low and small. Others are helped by their red color. The red plants change the sun's weak rays to make heat for themselves. Uh, that was really an interesting fact. I, I had never heard that before. All right, so we had bold uh, words again above the tree line. All right, so that's basically the line where the trees 
do not grow above that and will grow below that. And we have a caption with our pictures here, alpine flowers give the bare ground a burst of color. But you can see that even with the flowers blooming here, you still have snow up in the mountain peaks. Um, and then the caption that goes with this picture, small pikas can fit nicely under the rocks. So they're a small rodent. Um, only a few animals live in this frozen zone. Bighorn sheep are good climbers and use their skill to escape from predators. The sheep like the steep cliffs in the alpine. They spend most of their time in this zone. Pikas and marmots live all year in the alpine. They make dens under the rocks. Ptarmigans are the only birds that live in the alpine all year. They don't mind the cold. They turn white in the winter to blend in with the snow. And then um, they'll turn like a, a brown and white in the um, and, and tan kind of it in the summer so that they blend in with any anything that's growing there. And then we have another text box um, and it says only male big horns have the big curved horns. During mating season, males use their horns to battle. They crash into each other headfirst. The noise from the crash echoes through the mountains. And if you've ever heard that on a, you know, like a discovery show or whatever, it's, it makes a lot of noise. It's been quite a journey. We've traveled through three different life zones of Rocky Mountain National Park. The park is home to hundreds of species of plants and animals. It is a unique and special place. So again, bold face word. Um, and then we have a picture with a caption again. Many visitors use the hundreds of miles of hiking trails in the park. All right, so how do we know that Rocky Mountain National Park is expository text? And we can tell that, even if it didn't tell us on the cover, we can tell that because it gives us true facts about a real place. Okay. Um, let's move on because I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about especially this next part. All right. So um, this is talks about Yellowstone, which is another of our national parks. Okay. Yellowstone is another national park in the Rockies. It lies mostly in Wyoming, but partly in Montana and Idaho. Yellowstone has its own unique and special features. This park has more hot springs than any other place in the world. And then down here, the caption tells us hot springs form when rain or melted snow flows onto magma, which is very hot rock below the Earth's surface. And this feature is called a paint pot. Okay, because of the variation of colors that you see around it, which is due to the different minerals and things that are dissolved in that water. So you can see that there's uh, dark blue, there's the aqua to green, there's yellow, there's a reddish orange around them. Um, and if you if you um, would would go to their their website, there are pictures of those there as well. Geysers. Geysers are hot springs that erupt. They shoot hot water out like a fountain. So there's a bold word, and then it tells us what it means. Yellowstone has more than 200 geysers. Some of the geysers send water more than 100 feet in the air. Old Faithful, the most famous geyser in the park, erupts about every 90 minutes, which is why it's called Old Faithful, because it's so regular. Mud pots. Mud pots are hot springs that do not have much water. The water that is in a mud pot breaks down the rock into clay. The water and clay mixture turns into mud. Hot steam bubbles up through the layers of mud. And then the caption tells us that the gases in mud pots make them smell like rotten eggs. Okay, so, you know, what features make Yellowstone different from other parks? And it is all of this um, thermal activity where, you know, you have the hot springs and you have the geysers and you have these mud pots. Um, I'm not sure that any of the other parks in the United States if they have them at all, it's it's very few. Okay. Um, and then would you prefer to visit Yellowstone National Park or Rocky Mountain National Park? I'd have to vote for Yellowstone myself. Okay. Um, and earlier on in Remind, I told um, your parents that, um, you know, that was a good place to go. Any of the national parks have webcams. And so just a couple of days ago, I went to Yellowstone's 
um, webcams and they have a live webcam on Old Faithful. Usually they have on their predictions um, for when Old Faithful will erupt again. But right now the education center is closed. And so they're not putting those predictions up. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things you can do. You can either just kind of sit there and watch and see, you know, what it what it does. Or if you scroll farther on through their website, I found a video that shows it and you don't have to sit and wait for that to happen. So that's kind of an interesting virtual field trip. Um, and like I said, all of our national parks have websites. If you just search the name of the national park, um, you'll be able to find those. So I hope that you have the opportunity to do that and that you enjoy looking at some of those things that are so different from where we live. See you next time.